My name is Ricardo Villa. I am the project coordinator here at the Korea Center at the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Uh, today, as my colleague Anna said, we'll focus on uh, Nordic and Korean strategies for sustainable finance. And we have five experts with us today. And we will start uh, with a 10 minutes presentation from each uh, presenter, and then we'll move on to a Q&A session with the moderator, me, and a Q&A session with the audience. I will leave the floor to Mr. Jujin Kim. Uh, he's managing director and founder of Solution for Our Climate, a nonprofit organization in, based in South Korea. Thank you, thank you, Ricardo. Um, thank you for the introduction. My, as introduced, my name is Jujin Kim. I, um, I lead an organization called uh, Solutions for Our Climate. Uh, we are a nonprofit um, climate advocacy group based in Seoul, South Korea. Um, we have about 40 staffers um, as of today. Um, I, I was requested to talk about the work with we do and, and that how that relates to climate finance discussions in Korea, So, um, which is pretty much related to our work. Um, um, I, I, today, I'll, I'll try to go into uh, two topics, um, how uh, discussions on whether or not financing coal projects um, has been, I mean, how that discussion has taken place uh, in the past couple of years. And, uh, and the next issue coming up about whether Korea should be financing fossil fuel projects or the gas projects um, around the world. So um, coal and then uh, oil and gas, those are the two topics that I will talk about today. Um, our past, our country's past history of uh, public financing. So government financing, usually in the form of expert credits or uh, our, our government-led loans has been a problem. Um, we have been extensively, our government has been extensively supporting, financially supporting projects in Southeast Asia mainly, but also India, uh, Morocco, and Chile. And you can see who the beneficiaries of these projects are. Um, uh, these are, uh, uh, you can see a lot of utilities, you can see a lot of construction companies, but also you can see equipment companies, uh, Tucson Heavy Industries, um, which is uh, probably Korea's equivalent of Siemens or, or GE, um, has been a big beneficiary of coal project financing uh, because it has uh, a lot of, uh, it, it basically produces a lot of coal power plant uh, equipment. Um, so during the past 10 years, um, uh, um, I'm sorry that the period is here, it's probably between 2010 to 2019. During that period, about roughly $5 billion have been financed um, by Korea Exim Bank alone. Uh, this combined with Korea Trade Insurance Corporation would be about 10 billion um, per year. Uh, 10 billion during the uh, past uh, 10 years. So this was a problem. Um, a lot of protests, a lot of communications activity related to the problems of this. And last year, there was a ad on, I think this was in the Washington Post, um, kind of criticizing Korea's uh, financing of coal projects, potential financing of coal projects in Indonesia and Vietnam. Um, there's this ad on ad criticizing Samsung, um, a lot of protests in, by the youth done in Korea, and also a lot of discussions in, in our legislature. Um, these were a lot of questionings against uh, um, relevant ministries um, done in, inside our National Assembly. This was back in 2020, um, in which, I mean, several years of these kind of um, questioning by legislators has eventually led to results, um, plus a lot of communications and a lot of um, exposure of, of, of criticism to these financing activities. Uh, with, this eventually led to um, our national utility, KEPCO, Korea Electric Power Corporation's decision to no longer pursue coal power projects. Um, and Samsung also uh, decided to suspend, uh, stop its uh, coal power project, um, coal power project, the construction business. Um, um, and th these kind of, I would say, more government um, related efforts, I mean, government related de development. So I mentioned that um, our government was subject to a lot of uh, pressure to no longer finance coal. Um, Korea Electric Power Corporation, which is a government owned company, um, 
more than majority of government owned, also kind of um, uh, decided no longer to finance coal power products. All of these um, developments have, have watered down to the power sector and the private sector. And with that, um, we've seen a, a continuous flow of, of financial institutions putting out decisions to no longer finance new coal power plants. There is a extent, there is a there is a variance in, in the type of coal uh, coal finance moratoriums that our banks or financial institutions such as insurance companies have put out. But uh, uh, generally, in our financial sector, um, coal is not considered as a healthy product uh, project. So. Uh, product so but but there is a level of scrutinization between uh, uh, between the companies but as, as a general sense it, it has become um, um, uh, not a popular project uh, product anymore um, and with all this private sector led uh, uh, developments um, our president eventually um, says that we will no longer our government will no longer finance overseas coal projects at the U.S. Leader Summit on Climate, um, which was held on on April twenty second, uh, two thousand twenty one, uh, uh, um, yeah. So that's what he said. So, but so we thought everything would be finished. I mean, so Korea is no longer financing coal, and unfortunately, after this, what happened was uh, two months later, the Japanese Prime Minister um, at the G seven summit in the U.K. made a similar commitment, although there were some conditions. And then three months later at the UN General Assembly, uh, um, Xi Jinping, uh, the premier of China also made a similar uh, commitment. Um, and then at the same time, um, the power plants in, in Indonesia and Vietnam all changed very extensively because uh, noticing that they will not no longer be able to expecting uh, very good financing resources from East Asia. Um, they started to drop out, uh, drop New coal power projects that were anticipated inside from their uh, coal power, power new power project, new power project pipeline. So these were um, substantial substantial developments from from the work from, in Korea. However, um, um, the bigger elephant is inside the room. Um, uh, I was talking about coal and how much that was ten billion dollars. I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk. Um, oil and gas financing by Korean public financial institutions is one hundred twenty seven billion dollars about 13 times larger than the size of, of our coal financing. So uh, much more steeper hill, uh, a lot more ex bigger size of economy exposed. Uh, this is a year by year breakdown of the financing amounts. So, so you can see that, see the gray, gray, gray small stacks here are, is the coal financing that, made, that, were made, that was made at that year. And the, uh, um, uh, the brownish parts here, the long brownish parts on the, on the right side is oil and gas. You can see that it's really, really extensive. Um, oil and gas business is, for those who know, is usually divided into upstream, midstream, the transportation and, and the middle storage business, and then the downstream business, which is mainly the consumption of oil and gas. Um, um, our financing for oil and gas infrastructure is, is uh, pretty evenly divided in, in, among the chain. Um, with midstream as the highest portion. Um, uh, upstream would be mainly uh, e extraction projects. Um, and then, and then uh, downstream projects would be uh, 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 power projects or oil refineries or LNG terminals and things like that. Um, uh, the problem, uh, 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 I, I showed that uh, Midstream is the highest figure, and, and, and a big, a very important portion of midstream is is going to be the transportation of oil and gas. And there are two ways to transport oil and gas. One is through a pipeline. The other is through ships. Um, and Korea has the largest shipbuilding business in the world. Uh, it its market share is about forty four point two percent, which means that we build a lot of oil and gas related vessels, especially uh, LNG carriers and uh, crude oil carriers. Uh, we build about 73% of the world's LNG carriers and 81% and of the crude oil carriers, um, which makes Korea very important, I would say, uh, uh, um, topic in the oil and gas um, overall uh, global effort to, uh, to phase down um, oil and gas. Um, among the various vessels that we build, uh, natural gas carriers are, are, are uh, Take, I would say constitute the largest in terms of value. Oil carriers follow, and then drill ships, 
Mm, FSRUs and oil offshore platforms also are pretty big. So this is, uh, this will, we believe this will be a very big and important discussion, uh, climate discussion that should take place in the future. Uh, it will be a just transition issue in our Korea, in, in, in Korea because our shipyards constitute about 2% of our economy. So um, um, it will be a problem of how to um, soft plan this industry. Um, and this is an area that we will be really continuously looking into. So that's what I have for today. Thank you very much for inviting me and um, um, the floor is yours, Ricardo. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will move on uh, directly to Mr. Uh, Jakob König. Uh, he's project lead for Fair Finance Guide at the Swedish Customers Association. Uh, Mr. König, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. I hope it works. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Great. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jakob Koenig. I'm the researcher and project leader of the Swedish Fair Finance Guide Initiative. Um, and I'm gonna share a bit about how this initiative has become somewhat of a game changer on how Swedish banks are uh, working with sustainability issues. Um, the purpose of the initiative is to mobilize consumer pressure and strengthen civil society organizations to engage with financial institutions about how they uh, invest and um, finance uh, companies. And uh, because basically, the money that uh, financial institutions are using are uh, public money, uh, consumers' money on the, in the bank account or uh, the, in pension savings or other savings. Um, so uh, this is a collaborative initiative uh, between six civil society organizations. You see the logos at the top. I'm working at the consumer organization, uh, the Swedish Consumers Association, and uh, who is leading the project. And we work together with other civil society organizations that work with the sustainability issues on the ground, like human rights issues and environmental issues. Um, and I have a background working in the financial sector with sustainable, sustainable finance and investments. And I noticed that, um, that financial institutions can, we can improve their incentives to improve by involving their clients in this uh, process to transition to more sustainable business models. And we can also um, help this process by strengthening civil society organizations in engaging with uh, financial institutions. Because my experience was that civil society organizations had a challenge to, to talk with financial institutions about uh, their issues in the financial world because the financial world is it's quite special and you need the right uh, experience and knowledge to do that. So basically what Fair Finance Guide does is to provide a racetrack for financial institutions on how on performance uh, in terms of sustainability and we turn on the lights for the public so they can see what their money is doing and they can react to it. Um, and so this is quite a market-based, uh, it's about um, increasing transparency and letting important stakeholders have a say about how financial institutions act. And basically what we do is we benchmark financial institutions um, on sustainability. Um, we focus almost all, all on their financial activities, what considerations they take to sustainability when investing and financing companies. And we use an international methodology um, and then publish the results online on a public website where people can check their bank's performance and um, most importantly, uh, act on it by clicking on uh, send a complaint uh, button, either a positive or a negative, depending on what they think about their bank's performance. So then the banks get directly feedback from their own clients uh, about how they uh, perform. And then we campaign a lot about uh, this issue because most people have not been aware about that their money is actually linked to very severe sustainability issues, but also have the potential to do good. Uh, so bringing in uh, increasing transparency, you, you create a better 
opportunity uh, carrot and stick, uh, uh, you know, uh, situation for for financial institutions. And then we have a lot of dialogue with the financial institutions, with the banks, also with the regulators uh, and politicians, because um, it there there's a need of an independent voice in this field. Otherwise, the financial institutions can, uh, I think, exaggerate the the sustainability performance, uh, their sustainability performance. And this initiative is, is currently running in uh, 15 countries across four continents. Uh, just an example of a study uh, that we've done or repeated study about the bank's uh, fossil fuel investments and financing. We've done three studies uh, looking how, at how much each bank is uh, financing and investing in fossil fuel companies. Um, this ranking is from our last report a year ago, uh, showing the financing side, uh, which shows that uh, still, well, in total, 67 US billion dollar uh, have been financed um, since the Paris Agreement, but we also see very clear differences between banks. So some of these banks were very criticized based on the report, and some were actually cheered, even though they have some financing, they're relatively better and, and were applauded by, by their clients. Um, and we communicate this in a, in a simple and a bit fun way, because uh, most people think that finance and money and all those decisions are quite boring. So we, we use infographics, we use influencers, uh, social media to you know, spread the message about what their money, their banks, their pension funds are doing um, and how they can act simply on this. We also get a lot of media attention because um, most of the media's readers have one of these clients. So it's relevant to most people. And we reveal quite striking things about what the banks are doing. Um, and so far we had uh, over 38,000 people emailing their banks through our website, uh, expressing their concern about uh, this. And what has this led to? Well, it has had an, a tremendous impact on the banks. They have not been used to this kind of monitoring and uh, especially not uh, getting this uh, kind of pressure from their own clients. Um, so um, we, we have seen a very clear policy improvement, uh, over 300% policy improvement regarding specific sustainability issues, which means in practice that they have committed to around 70 new uh, sustainability commitments per bank since the launch in 2015. Um, which means that commitments that apply, should be applied to their finance, financial activities, so that these principles should apply on the companies that they uh, finance and invest in. But we, we, all, we also see uh, uh, not only the policy improvements, but also practical improvements um, that um, a lot of uh, exclusions of specific companies that, that refuse to transition or act responsibly. We see, especially the fossil fuel sector, uh, actually uh, fossil, free, fossil free has become, become the new norm, normal among the largest, biggest banks. Um, so they have kind of divested in principle from uh, fossil fuels. They do finance them still, uh, which is a big problem. But we also see some uh, promising improvements with new restrictions, especially direct in, 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 in um, connection with our reports. Um, in the last year, we've seen uh, a lot of new fossil policies uh, after we released our report. Um, we saw also a lot of more innovation uh, within sustainable investment products. It's been not developing much uh, historically, but with more pressure from the clients asking for better solutions that are better, it's a better business case for them to develop uh, something that is more sustainable. And we also triggered regulators and politicians to act on this once you know the public, their voters are reacting to what the financial institutions are doing because there's been and still is a lack of regulation regarding this. It's, 
sustainability is still a voluntary aspect in the financial world. And you see the ranking uh, illustration here, that, that's the average policy score of the seven largest Swedish banks since the launch, since our first assessment. So it's improved um, significantly. And just uh, lastly, um, so this, this uh, initiative, it's not Swedish, it's originally uh, created in, in the Netherlands um, by uh, Oxfam is the lead organization and it's been spread now to Sweden and uh, 13 other countries so far. Uh, the last country to join was South Africa. We have many countries in Asia, in Japan, in India, Thailand, Indonesia, Cambodia. Vietnam, uh, Philippines, um, but also Brazil and a lot of some countries in Europe, like Germany, Norway. Um, and we're, we're constantly uh, expanding to, to new countries. And Asia is, um, has a regional uh, net, is a regional, um, uh, has a regional uh, sub network, uh, Fair Finance Asia it's called, where all the Asian chapters are under uh, you see the illustration here where the green colored countries are the ones where fair finance uh, the fair finance initiative is running they recently launched a fossil fuel or coal finance report that got quite a lot of attention they also had a side event at the cop 26 uh, conference uh, it's called the future without coal and you see the countries that were covered in this report uh, also countries that where the fair finance uh, is not established yet and i think this is especially interesting because we uh, because uh, korea is one of the countries that um, are regional the fair finance asia regional uh, secretariat is interested to expand to and uh, similar to japan uh, start uh, assessing korean banks and engaging uh, korean consumers and civil society organizations to help uh, help this transition. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, we'll move next on to Dr. Uh, Keith Lee. He's a senior analyst at Cicero Shades of Green. Uh, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Ricardo. And, and thank you very much to ISDP for inviting me to uh, present today. So. Presumably you can see my screen. Uh, I've just been asked to introduce a little bit about what Cicero Shades of Green does. Um, and then look, very much look forward to the, the discussion afterwards. But um, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, my, my intention today is to introduce a little bit about who we are and, and our methodology. Um, so starting off with, with who we are, uh, Cicero Shades of Green, we are a, a second party opinion provider in, in the green bond and sustainability bond space. And I'll touch a little bit upon the role of uh, SPO providers shortly, but we've been doing this for a, a long time now. Um, we were, I mean, as Cicero Shades of Green itself was you know, separated out from the Cicero Research Center in Norway. Um, that's the Center for International Climate and Environment Research, which, has, which is established to work on climate change, um, which has and has been contributing to the IPCC since 1992. Um, Cicero Shades of Green, as I mentioned, was separated out in about three or four years ago to focus on the second opinion work. But Cicero as a research center has been involved in the green bond market since uh, the very first green bond, which was issued by the World Bank in 2008. And, um, and how that came to pass was, you know, the, the, you know, the, the World Bank was, was going to issue a green bond, um, had um, kind of was going to collaborate with SEP, the, the Swedish bank on this. And, and one of the, the potential investors thought that it might be a good idea to, to get a science-based opinion on, on the, the use of proceeds for that very first green bond. And, and that was how the first second party opinion was born. And, and since then we've grown into the one, one of the largest um, providers of second party opinions in the market. So you can see here on the right-hand slide, that's our cumulative uh, market share by green bond market, um, green bond volume issuance. Um, and, you know, over 10 years of experience with over 180 issuers uh, across multiple sectors, private sector, um, multilateral development banks, sovereign issuers, financial institutions. Uh, we're very proud to have uh, been awarded a number of awards, um, as you can see here on, on, the, on the bottom left, 
um, recognizing the, the quality uh, of our approach um, by investors, especially. So what, what is the role of second party opinions in, in the green financing market? Well, you know, as you know, you know, this market has, has grown rapidly um, over the last, well, I mean, since the, the first green bond was issued in 2008. Um, and, and, and there is an, you know, it's important uh, for that market to, to have integrity. Um, in the sense that, you know, the issuers firstly need to follow up on, on what they plan to do um, once having, you know, having raised capital from the green bond market, um, they have to draft what's called a framework, which identifies what they plan to do with, with that capital. Um, and then those investments that they plan to make with that capital is supposed to be green, right? So how do in investors know that? Um, and how do investors get that assurance that those investments are indeed green. I mean, that, that's what the role of the second party opinion provider um, is, is there for. And, and so basically we engage with the issuers to understand their intentions and provide transparency around what their investments are going to be used for. Um, and we also provide transparency around some of the governance considerations uh, of the issuer in terms of what is their overall sustainability strategy how does the, the sustainability strategy fit with the use of proceeds that, that they're planning to, to execute? Um, you know, in, in other words, is the green bond actually supporting their overall trajectory and, and direction on, on sustainability? Um, and, and that's important because you know, when, when you're issuing, when it comes to green bond issuance, um, th there is a need to, to understand whether, whether companies or issuers are being more opportunistic uh, with respect to trying to access the green bond market, or whether they are actually using this source of capital to actually support their overall strategy. And an example of that is, is for instance, a, you know, a fossil fuel refiner um, may, or a, a power plant operator, a coal power plant operator uh, may seek to issue green bonds to improve the energy efficiency of their, of their refineries or, or their power plant. Um, and, and that may, re may lead to emissions reductions in the short term, but whether that's actually something that's needed for the longer term overall transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future is another question, um, which is why, you know, with, with the, when it comes to the second party opinions, we are trying to write that transparency on the overall trajectory of the issuer, as well as the, the planned uh, use of the green bond proceeds. Um, but in, in addition to that, you know, what it helps to do is also helps to build capacity among investors on, on what is green, right? So the, the more second party opinions um, come out uh, and, and the more independent opinions there are, um, the better investors are able to compare and, and understand um, what, what user proceeds are, are being rated green and, um, and what are the ins and outs of, of different sectors and different kinds of uh, issuances. So on, on to a little bit about our methodology. Um, and you know, I imagine some, most of you have probably seen some version of this slide um, in, in one form or another um, by now. But you know, our methodology is, is very much rooted in, in the fact that any investments and any businesses are going to be exposed to climate-related risks and financial impacts. So whether that's physical risks, you know, in terms of extreme weather and, and so on, or transition risks related to changes in policies, like um, legislations and technologies um, that would change the market, market and regulatory conditions um, that may affect demand and cost of capital for, for uh, businesses. Um, all of that is going to have potential financial impacts. And, and so we, we try and in, basically we're trying to provide transparency not only on the environmental credentials of the planned investments from the green bonds, but we also provide transparency around the exposure that, that they face uh, to climate related risk as well. Um, because you know, for, for, to give another example, you can have um, an investment in a solar power plant, but if that's on the coastline and it's exposed to you know, increasing coastal flooding and more extreme weather, that is still a potentially very risky investment for an investor. So we are trying to shed, uh, shed light on the physical and transition risks associated with, with green investments. Um, and so with, you know, across our methodology, you, you'll see a very common theme of thinking about life cycle impacts, um, a systems thinking approach to assessing the, the investments. Um, and then also consideration for potential lock-in effects of emissions. So are these green bond investments potentially going to contribute to the extension of emissions you know, over the life of the investment, for example? And you know, that comes back to the energy efficiency example with the refinery or the power plant. 
you know, is that energy efficiency investment potentially going to extend the lifetime of emissions associated with, uh, with that asset? So our, our assessments have three main components. And um, maybe I just also should have said that, you know, we're, not only are we looking at green bonds, but increasingly we're also looking at sustainability linked bonds um, and, and sustainability bonds as well that are combining green and social purposes. But in, in general, you know, to generalize across those kinds of assessments, what we're doing is we're applying our shading methodology to, uh, to, to shade the, the use of proceeds categories that are included in the green bond frameworks. Um, in the case of sustainability linked bonds and, and company assessments, where we are assessing an overall company approach, and, and that's separate from the bond market, that, that's more of an equity approach, but I, I won't go into that into detail here. We are shading the, the revenues and the capital expenditures um, of those issuers to provide, again, greater transparency to investors. Uh, we look at the governance score, where we're looking at the sustainability and climate governance and the targets and strategies that issuers have in place. And then we also opine on the alignment with the International Capital Market Association principles, for instance, the green bond principles or the sustainability linked bond principles, um, just to, to check whether there's um, alignment with best practice. And, and when necessary, we also provide assessments of alignments with EU taxonomy. So our shading methodology is, is what we do. You know, this, is, this is something that we apply um, to the use of proceeds frameworks. Um, and you know, it, an overall shade of green gets uh, assigned. So we have three shades of green, dark green, medium green, and light green. Dark green is for those projects which we, we, might, we might already consider aligned to a low carbon and climate resilient future. Light green is for transition activities, which might generate emissions reductions in the short run, but in, in and of themselves, they're not necessarily contributing to that longer term 2050 vision. Uh, and then in the middle, we have medium green projects, which fall somewhere in between. Then for our sustainability linked bonds and company assessments, where we are also assessing revenues and capex, we also have yellow shade of green and a red shade, sorry, a yellow shading and a red shading. Um, yellow shading is for projects that have some emissions, may not contribute to transition. And then red shading is for those projects which are fundamentally incompatible uh, with a low carbon and climate resilient future. So these are you know, new fossil fuel infrastructure, um, in activities linked to deforestation and, and land use change and so on. The other aspect of the assessment is the governance score, as I said, and that's where we're trying to shed light on, on the issuer and the considerations that it's making overall in terms of its trajectory, as I mentioned, you know, with respect to the low carbon transition. So we're looking at what kinds of policies and goals they have in place. Um, we're looking at the selection process that, being, that is being used to identify um, investments that are eligible under the framework. And then lastly, what, what are the considerations they have for, for reporting um, on, on projects to the investors? And that's reporting on how the process, proceeds are being used. Um, you know, are they actually being allocated to, to projects that they said they would finance? Um, and then also reporting on impacts. So what is the, what is the environmental, positive environmental or social impacts that are being generated from those projects? Um, so I'm, I know I'm out of time, so I, and I might leave this slide for, for the Q&A and, and the discussion. And uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Looking forward to, to speaking further. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we will move on to uh, Dr. Maltes. Uh, he's Program Director at Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center. Uh, Dr. Maltes, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. I'll just share my presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yep. Yes. Good. Great. Thanks for having me today and uh, inviting me to this uh, interesting webinar. Um, my name is Aaron Maltes. I'm a senior researcher at the Stockholm Environment Institute and the program director for, for Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center, which is housed at the Stockholm uh, Environment Institute. Um, and the Stockholm Stable Finance Center is a partnership between uh, SCI, where I work, and the Stockholm School of Economics. We started in 2018. <clears throat> uh, we are uh, funded uh, originally through the Swedish government, uh, and we're also supported by an advisory board that's representing key institutions in uh, Sweden's uh, finance sector. And the mandate for the Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center is to support the transitions to sustainable finance in developing and developed regions through training, research, and sector uh, engagement and policy support. Uh, 
so I can say a little bit about uh, the, the funders we've had as well, give an insight into the type of work we do. So we have core funding from, from the government uh, to, to run the center and, and to initiate our own research projects. Um, we also get funding from research councils um, and we're very much a research oriented organization because of the institutions that make up the center are also research oriented. But we also have done uh, project and consultancy work for, for other actors. So for example, the World Bank, um, Sweden Sustainable Finance, uh, Sweden Sustainable Investment Forum, uh, we've done a project for. We've, we've grants from the private sector and also project work from the private sector. And we've done some work for the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency recently. And we're also currently doing some work for the European Climate Foundation. So if I go into the three main pillars of the work we do, the training uh, that we've done, and this was kind of the original idea behind the center was uh, the idea that uh, we, there would be some uh, training for green bonds issuances in emerging and developing markets. So this was the IFC uh, program uh, for buying uh, green bonds, their big green bond fund, and they needed a technical assistance uh, work to uh, kind of uh, do some capacity building in the regions in which they wanted to invest in these green bonds. And Sweden was a candidate for doing this work. And that idea snowballed all into this idea of actually building a center. So we started with the training idea and that uh, work has now been ongoing for, for some years uh, with in collaboration with the IFC and now actually independently. And that, done, that work is done largely by uh, the Stockholm School of Economics. And so far we have trained over 60 bankers live in Stockholm on how to um, issue uh, green bonds. Uh, we've also recently delivered the program uh, in uh, Africa, uh, funded by SWED Fund and in collaboration with, with SCI. Um, we're planning to deliver this uh, program now in Asia as well. Um, and we also have a, a two-day course on sustainable finance that is run by the Stockholm School of Economics Executive Education. If we go to the research side, um, I would say our research is, is, is quite diverse, but it's focused on three, three main areas. So it's the financial sector practice, it's on financing transitions, and it's on scaling sustainable finance in developing countries. So I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of, of the types of work that we've done. Um, so when we're looking at financial sector practice, we've done some work looking at uh, financial actors' perspective on what's long-term and what's not. Uh, and, and shown that there's quite diversity in perspectives of what counts as long-term and not in that sector and how can actors take a more long-term perspective. Uh, asking some fundamental questions about to what extent can the financial sector actually be a driver for sustainability? What's a reasonable expectations and, and what's maybe a little bit too much of hype in this, in this space? We've done quite a bit of work looking at green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, sustainability linked bonds, asking some fundamental questions about how impactful are our green bonds in driving transitions, how green are green bonds, what role do they play in adaptation, um, and how can we get impact uh, from sustainability linked bonds, which are a new kind of instrument in the market. Um, we've done some work looking at uh, some of these net zero commitments that investors are, 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 are increasingly making, and how can we move from these commitments to real impact in the economy. Um, we're also looking at questions of how can you get uh, sustainability impact through debt markets more broadly than just on the labeled bonds market side. Uh, done some work also doing some of this mapping work uh, that Fair Finance has done, similar type of thing, looking at how green or brown are Swedish financial flows. Um, done some work on the alignment of investments and the SDGs, and that's some ongoing work. Uh, how does the how how does the how does the finance sector think about uh, SDGs in their in their sustainable finance work and, and how can we think about it a little bit more systematically. And then uh, we're on, ongoing, doing some ongoing work on transparency and deforestation linked to a big project at SCI called Trace Finance. And we're doing some research using their data, trying to think about, about the, the transparency of, of financial actors' uh, uh, portfolios in relation to deforestation. 
So another pillar of our work is looking at financing of transitions. So we've done some work on cities in Sweden, climate and, and finance. So what's the role of private finance in helping cities to, to become climate neutral? And that work is initially started by SSFC and it's kind of taken on a life of its own now. And it's a big project um, at SCI. We've done some work on industrial transitions. So looking at the cost of uh, decarbonizing heavy industry in Sweden. Um, and then now looking at some investment and financing obstacles to, uh, and how we can actually overcome them so we can increase the pace of decarbonization. And the, those two projects are, are Swedish focused. And now we're looking, expanding a bit and now going into some developing countries, looking at steel investments in developing countries, trying to map this and see how, how do development uh, banks interact with this sector and do they have policies in place to be leaders in, in the green transition in, in emerging and developing countries. And this is in collaboration with, with some of the other work that SEI does on, on industry transitions globally. Um, we have a kind of a large program on that. And then finally, and this is where our focus is more this year because our funding this year is more focused towards uh, developing countries, looking at how to scale sustainable finance in these, in, in these regions. So we've previously done some work on green bonds in, in, in Africa, currently gonna be publishing a report on DFIs and how they are um, helping to promote or could better promote national SDG agendas. Um, work on scaling investments in renewable energy in Africa especially concerned with issues of cast of capital and de-risking. How are these mechanisms working? What's best practice and how could we scale them? Uh, we would like to do a flagship report on the large sustainable finance landscape in Africa. We, there's a bit of a gap there. And so we'd like to fill that by, by giving some, some broad understanding of the trends and the instruments and, and, the, and the missing pieces to, to get that to scale up. Uh, and then we've done some work uh, previously linking some uh, MDB's investments to SDG impact and, and giving them methods, helping them with methods to think about that. And then the final pillar of the, the way we work is we, of course, want to engage with policy uh, actors and, and, and financial sector actors to, to support them in their, their transitions. Uh, you know, we largely support them as experts, as sustainability experts. Um, uh, but we have a number of ways and forums to do this. So early on, we brought together a set of investors um, to discuss the first blue bond issuance in the Nordics. And that eventually did lead to a blue bond issuance by the Nordic uh, Investment Bank. We've been having events and engaging internationally in forums like the UN Finance uh, for Development Forum. Um, we've done some support work uh, to the Green Climate Fund and also worked with the Swedish government in helping them work with the Green Climate Fund and thinking about the policy improvements there. Um, an example of an interesting thing we've done in a kind of a research engagement environment is the World Water Week in Sweden. We brought in a kind of a new idea there where um, actors from different countries could do a pitch session to investors and kind of learned a lot about how the, the, these different actors are speaking different languages. And it was a really useful lesson for both the investors and, and for the different groups that, that took to the session to, to do some capacity building. Um, we've worked with the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance members here in Sweden, thinking about how can you actually implement your net zero targets in a way that's, that's uh, impactful. And of course, in our work with industry yeah, here in Sweden, we spend a lot of time uh, interviewing and engaging with financial actors and industrial uh, actors in Sweden. Uh, also done some work at the EU level, so had some events on, on Green Deal, hydrogen industry, uh, giving some feedback on the EU taxonomy uh, work. And then we've done some kind of uh, work with the public inquiries here in Sweden. So one of them was on green savings. So uh, this is just some examples, but a, a broad, broad type of um, uh, engagement. And we have a nice opportunity to do that as we're an independent research institute. So we can both engage with private sector and policymakers and the research community. Uh, uh, and it's a, that's the approach that we've been taking. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maltese, for the presentation. Um, we will move on to the last presenter for today, uh, Dr. Eunjung Kim.
She's a research fellow at the Korean Legislation Research Institute. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Oh, can you see my my screen? Yes. Okay. Why I didn't see it? Uh, okay. Actually, uh, I'm very sorry because uh, I'm based on legislation. So just I prepared for my presentation based focusing on legislation, especially focusing on sustainable finance in Korea. So in my presentation, I will explain about two things. First one is Korean ESG. As you, I think you are well known about some ESG concept and background and the other kind of discussions. Uh, especially in Korea, also we have many issues on ESG after, uh, after discussing climate finance and some green bonds. And, and then also I will show you about the benefit sharing discussion in Korea. So in Korea also we have lots of a vision to activate and improve of the renewable energy. Uh, focusing on wind power. So for that, uh, actually the acceptance of citizens near the areas, it's very important. So that's why we uh, made some new, new acts on beneficiary. So I will just explain about two concepts. First one, I will show you some Korean ESG. So after the COVID-19 in Korea, the non-financial achievements of full attention, ESG is very important. So you are well known about the ESG concept, environmental, social, and governance to maintain corporate sustainability. So actually this is the very similar concept of social responsibility of cooperation. And then the other, people mentioned about it, some um, social responsibility investment. So in Korea also, we have a lot of the issues of ESG because ESG is the kind of new, new investment standards for the shareholders, especially the other, some investment company, BlackRock, something like that. So also they mentioned they will focusing on concentrate on the ESG concept too much. So that's why in Korea also we have very hard issues on ESG. So sustainable investment and social responsibility investment. So many corporations made their own the voluntary standards for the governance concept. So it's kind of another new criteria for assessment but still it's the voluntary concept. So we have many kind of some guidelines, especially Korea Financial Service Commission. They announced the, the comprehensive improvement standards for the corporate disclosure system, but it's kind of just the guidelines. So some corporations can accept kind of some strategy, but it's the voluntary concept. So that's why in Korea many many ministries and then the other Korean National Assembly Act and then introduced to try to make the ESG concept in legislation, but still working on. So, and then in Korea also we have 84% of recently published sustainability reports are externally validated. So it's working and then it will be more, uh, more activated 2030. Uh, and then next one, I want to show you about some benefit sharing of wind power in Korea. 
actually in Korea, we have very ambitious target to improve some renewable energy. So that's why we uh, focus and we invest lots of a project for wind power. So we already have a wind power, and then we try we make it, we make planning to more wind power. So at that time, the to make some acceptance of citizens is very important. So we made a kind of new beneficiary concept benchmarked by Denmark. So we already acted new legislation, Korean Renewable Energy Act, Article 27 or two. So we make a kind of residence participant participation. So in this article mentioned to establish the wind power at the time, some company, power company needed to embark their residents. So we made some kind of specific guidelines. So first one, we divided the area, near area. So closed area of the wind power, they can get more shares to invest. So the other things, also the power company make lots of kind of financial derivatives. So first one, we are considering about making some public fund to, to, to correct investment among the residents. And then also we are thinking about to uh, issue shares of the corporations. And then that's why finally we want to many residents and then further some people, national people can be a shareholder of the wind power. So we share some benefit to them. So it's kind of a new concept. And then still considering how to operate about this uh, benefit sharing, but it will be very uh, motivative. And then we finally consider it's kind of new secondary derivative market for renewable energy. And then this kind of system is also uh, delivered to the other sectors like uh, waste or the other some, uh, some energy part, something like uh, oxygen. So it's kind of some new way to correct some money and then also share some benefit to the other kind of peoples. So just I want to show you about some kind of new concept and then policy and legislation to activate renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for the insightful presentation. Um, and thank you everybody for, um, for presenting. Um, uh, Dr. Kim, could you please uh, stop sharing your screen by any chance? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you again for the presentations. I, I would like to start with uh, a more general question um, addressed to everybody, I guess. Um, from your presentations, and since we're in general in the field of sustainable financing, this whole idea is that um, sustainable financing conflates uh, climate risks issues with economic growth in a sustainable manner. Um, how does uh, this interplay with, uh, with the general trend of the transition at the moment? Um, how does... Uh, also the inclusion of not only green bonds, but also social bonds and what Dr. Kim has just talked about, ESGs, um, which are environment, social, and uh, governance uh, related um, investments. How do they interplay with each other and how impactful are one onto each other, especially the last uh, idea of social bonds? Um, if anybody would like to address or to start the question, otherwise I will pick one of you. Okay, uh, then uh, Dr. Maltese, would you, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I'm, 
I guess the question is is about the how how impactful are these different instruments in in driving the transition forward? And I think that uh, I mean it depends on on the instrument you're looking at. Uh, um, but I think if you're looking at the bonds side, the labeled uh, bond side, I think there is an issue there of of thinking about the extent to which this is a, a a product that is kind of labeling the green side of the financial market as it is versus the extent to which it's actually pushing the financial market to be more green. And I think that's been the big criticism of, of that side of the market. And I think the way the financial sector maybe sometimes markets these issues is that well, we're directing so and so much money to renewable energy or to social projects. But that's maybe the wrong way to think about the way it has impact because those projects probably would have been, had financing at good terms without the label because of the nature of the type of financing it is. It's usually, it's usually things that are quite you know, well established and investment grade and so forth. Uh, so the way it does have impact is more on uh, integrating sustainability thinking throughout the process. So you have a dynamic, you're creating a dynamic where investors and issuers are having dialogues with each other on their sustainability performance all the time. Um, and I think as that expands through different financial products and, 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 and through the financial sector more, then, then it's, it has an, uh, this kind of socialization or this uh, uh, mission uh, shift focus. And then you can see it in other things where, for example, um, companies are more and more committing to science-based targets. And that makes that discussion with investors much clearer and easier. So, so I think it's sometimes they overemphasize the extent to which you're seeing like big shifts in capital and where it's actually more of a, a slow shift in, 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 in the focus of, of uh, investors and the types of dialogues they view as important. So yeah, so that's, that's one example. Maybe if I can weigh in. Um... I, I'm not sure, you know, to what extent the audience is is familiar with this language of, you know, green bonds and, and ESG and, and impact investments and so on. So, I, I thought it might be useful. I think one thing that um, is useful to, to clarify and, and maybe discuss a little bit is, and, and it relates a little bit to what uh, to what Aaron was saying, um, is that when we think about you know, green bond investments and, and impact investments, we're really thinking about, you know, investments which are trying to create positive uh, outcomes. Um, and, you know, that extends to, to social bonds as well, you know, to, to what you were saying, Ricardo, right, on the social side of things. Um, and I, I, obviously that, that is, is very important. I, I think, you know, Aaron's points around the questions of whether there is actual additionality from, from labeled instruments is, is an important one. And I, I, I largely agree with what, with what he said. Um, but I think there's a lot of focus on making green investments um, and, and a lot of focus from, for instance, banks and asset managers highlighting, you know, they have commitments to, to scaling up the portion of their portfolios, which are dedicated to green and sustainable finance. Um, but if you look at, and I, I don't have the figures on me, I'm afraid, but if you look at the portion of green and sustainable and, you know, social bonds as a percentage of the wider bond market, it is still a drop in the bucket. It's it's tiny. I think I think the figure is you know at most single digit percentages, if not you know two percent. Um, so I guess what what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of financing out there, which is going to conventional investments, um, and that is increasingly being covered, or those those kinds of investments and that kind of lending is increasingly being integrating environmental, social, and governance factors. And, and that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about ESG investments. Um, but even within that kind of investment, there's, there's a big span of approaches, right? There's, there's very basic approaches where investors are saying, okay, we're good. We're just gonna screen out the companies that are doing the most bad. You know, we, we don't wanna be associated with companies that are in weapons manufacturing, with human rights abuses and so on. Um, but then it can be, you know, the, the extent to which these factors can be integrated into investments can, can then be, um, become more and more sophisticated to the points where you have investors, you know, adjusting the valuation models that they're using um, with um, ESG factors, um, and then also engaging with, com with companies in their portfolios to, to try and drive corporate behavior change. Um, and, and that is, um, I, I think that's really important to point out because, um, you know, there is so much business as usual activity 
that needs to be um, that that whose environmental and social impacts needs to be addressed um, in in terms of you know just taking conventional activity and and making that um, more more sustainable and and that's a slightly different conversation um, from from green sustainability and social bonds. Although, as as Aaron has mentioned, right, you know, the the green issuance of green bonds helps to foster a lot of dialogue between investors and can actually help to create a culture and, and discussion around sustainability that, that's critically important. Um, and then just to, the final point is, is that when, when it comes to the integration of ESG issues into investments, I think the approach so far has been very much of a risk approach in terms of saying that, you know, we want to make sure that companies are addressing these risks so that they do not impact their business performance, right? But that, that's slightly different from saying that we want these companies to have a positive impact on environment and society. Um, and I think some of the most sophisticated investors are recognizing this and they're starting to shift their approach to conventional investments you know, outside of the green bond space, for instance, to one in which they are saying, okay, we're not only are we looking at minimizing risk, we're looking for companies and you know, we're talking about big companies that are able to demonstrate a positive environmental and social impact. So I think you know, to summarize that, I think we're looking at the extension of impact oriented thinking for outside of, you know, yeah, extending from outwards of the green and social bond space to more conventional investments now as well. Mr. Kerning, you had a comment or um, a question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 we really encourage the increase in, in uh, sustainable investment and financing and, and percentage wise, it's, 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 it's incredible, but it's also as, important or perhaps even more important to phase out the unsustainable uh, activities. So, I mean, from a consumer perspective and civil society perspective, or from a, you know, a, a bank client perspective, most people are not happy with an uh, investment product that just because it contains a few solar panels and windmills, if it also contains some coal power plants. So, <clears throat> and they also, uh, want their bank to be a responsible institution so even though they selected responsible products or sustainable products they don't want their bank to finance the worst types of fossil fuel extraction uh, at the same time they want to be a client in a bank that is responsible uh, as a whole so uh, so getting rid of the of the bad stuff is as important to you know uh, invest more in, in the in the solutions Okay, um, then lacing onto this, um, how do governments then interact with this kind of uh, idea of phasing out the bad stuff like brown investments or, or investments that are uh, going to sustain uh, well carbon production and are not uh, good to reach net zero uh, commitments that have been made in the last few years uh, and et cetera. Uh, how, how much is also government intentionality to, to make change uh, put into this and how, how does this not turn also into greenwashing uh, from, from also companies that try to actually take these funds and, and make it look like that they're acting in a way that is sustainable while it is not. Uh, if, I'd, I'd be happy to respond uh, to that. Uh, it's, I, I mean, just like with consumers and civil society uh, organizations, I, I think uh, politicians and regulators are also a bit inferior towards the financial sector regarding sustainability issues. It's very tricky field. Um, it's easy to get impressed by presentations by financial institutions on their sustainability work. And I think, um, that's that's one challenge that that uh, you know regulators think that things are are solving itself. Um, another thing is that I we we see that politicians are hoping to kind of solve the problem by getting the financial sector to solve the problem. So kind of on the EU level, the taxonomy and all these new regulations that is coming, uh, they hope that the financial sector would they will create some kind of a 
business case for financial institutions to uh, make this change without changing the the fundamental economic uh, you know uh, how to say aspects on the ground you know making it more expensive to to pollute and and like that so i think there's perhaps an over uh, op optimistic uh, uh, sense in the, on the political level that the financial sector would somehow magically solve this problem by creating the taxonomy and but we can help i mean with with, with the more more transparency it 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 goes in the right direction but i think also the financial sector is expressing this you have to change the rules on the ground then we can we can uh, flow the money <laughs> where it should go you know yeah yes please dr martins <clears throat> No, I'd just like to echo that comment. I mean, at the fundamental level, the, the finance sector can't be greener than the economy that it invests in. So, so that's, uh, if you look at it at the aggregate, and so that's, and in our research, we see that a lot from the, from the financial sector as well, is that they are maybe a bit unexpectedly, but, but they are calling for a lot more political leadership in, you know, setting high, uh, carbon prices and global carbon prices that create the kinds of incentives and certainty for them so that they know where to to allocate the capital and, and what the what the pathway ahead is and I also echo this this concern about thinking that somehow the financial sector will uh, will be able to drive this transition on its own when you're actually um, it's, it's quite difficult given their their mandates or their business models to do things that are good for society, but are loss creating, I mean, at the end of the day. So, so, so you have to have be a little bit realistic about the extent to which the financial sector can, can, uh, can take on this role. At the same time, we, we do see a dynamic where, where because of these commitments that these actors have been making, and also because some of the criticisms of the impactfulness of some of the approaches, we heard about ESG, mostly focusing on risk and so forth, that there's, it's good. It's in kind of an interesting inflection point right now. Um, how will these financial actors actually achieve these these uh, these uh, net zero targets, these ambition net zero targets they have? And so we may see things where they're investing more in their engagement and trying to engage more with entire sectors and 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 collaborating more and investing with value chains to go to try to get companies and and uh, to be all kind of on the same page. So that uh, that we're kind of moving in the right direction, but but I also have some doubts that that uh, simple transparency will work. But at the same time, what are the proposals for stronger policy then? Uh, because so, as soon as you start putting stronger policy in place on the financial sector, you're basically telling people, well, this is how you can and can't spend your money, and uh, and that's a that's a difficult challenge as well. So, if anyone has any ideas here in the in the group, I'm happy to hear those ideas. Okay, um, what uh, what then are the major difference, uh, in this case regionally, uh, especially for the webinar in, in the Nordics and, and, and Korea in this case, and maybe uh, broader Asia, what are the actions that um, governments are, are taking at the moment in this, while avoiding this, this hard line of telling people where to spend their money and, and all that, are, are there any any trends uh, in this direction. So if, if I um, recall your question, right, so you want to know what the difference is between, I noticed that there were a lot of um, questions in the chat about the uh, Nordic uh, South Korean relationship and, um, and uh, um, how, what kind of activities we do in Korea to to engage, um, well, I guess uh, first of all, there's a big difference in 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 a country where where you have Greta and the number of people you have per capita that come out of climate strikes compared to what you see here. We we do have climate strikes, but um, uh, the absolute level of appreciation of the climate issue is is different, and that is all reflected inside the policy policy making scene. So that's one thing I must I, I must mention. Um, However, um, uh, I mean, as, uh, so, so um, the reason that's reflected in the fact that whereas in Sweden, the problem of coal financing would have 
would have been resolved a couple of years ago. Um, for us, it's been resolved just quite recently. And then, and, and um, oil and gas also is, is another issue that um, I think the Swedes are pretty much, I think, confident of, of resolving. So I think that's, um, that's one of the things that, uh, uh, that's different. Um, another, another thing I could, uh, another thing I must mention is that uh, um, there, there is a very interesting um, Swedish-Korean uh, relationship here. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned about the uh, South Korea, South Korea's overseas coal financing moratorium and, 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 and the global attention related to that. Um, Swedish banks did come in and see, I think, for example, the head of Nordea, I believe, uh, wrote an op-ed, or I think was on an interview, criticizing um, the uh, Korean national utility of its practice financing overseas coal projects. So, so uh, Swedish investors did get in the scene. Um, we also see a lot of, uh, um, um, especially Swedish um, involvement in, in the green steel scene. Uh, not, not, not exactly about sustainable finance, but um, uh, as a promoter of, of introducing uh, uh, a good, good, better standards in, in the steel scene. Um, the Swedish government, Swedish government is, and, and Swedish um, commercial society is also acting pretty um, actively. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, and, and I think there are some other questions, uh, but um, I'll, I'll get back to that later on. Please, Keith, uh, go ahead. Yep. Thanks. I think you are also asking a little bit about you know some of the differences we see in the governmental approaches to things. Um, and maybe maybe I should have also provided some context to, to my own background. So I'm I'm based in Oslo, where where Cicero Shades of Green is headquartered. But prior to taking on this role, I worked with the, uh, the WWF in the sustainable finance practice, um, both out of Singapore and in South Korea, where we did a lot of engagement with financial institutions on the ground. Um, so I, I think you know just from my experience there, um, you know I, I find that the the EU taxonomy in, in particular. Um, has kind of been a, a little bit path-breaking, right, in groundbreaking in terms of, of a regulatory initiative uh, that, that is designed to, to promote more sustainable finance. Um, and you know, I, I agree with what's been said before that you, you can't just rely on you know, increased transparency and includes the increased disclosures um, to kind of address the fundamental, fundamental issues with the economy. Um, but that being said, you know, I think the, the EU taxonomy has, um, you know, <laughs> at a minimum, you know, started a huge amount of conversation um, around, around sustainable investment, um, the related regulations, you know, requiring uh, asset managers to, to disclose how they're making use of the taxonomy and, and how, and especially where funds that are being marketed as green, you know, how they're making use of that taxonomy. Um, I, I think that that has been... Um, you know, as I said, in at, at a minimum, kind of in the right direction, um, but maybe maybe not the, the silver bullet. But what's been interesting to see is how regulators in, in the Asia region have have looked at that, um, and many of many of whom are following suit. So you know, um, uh, obviously, I think Korea is probably the latest country to to announce a taxonomy with the K taxonomy uh, being announced or finalized in January this year. Um, but you know, before then, we have the Singapore Monetary Authority of Singapore also announcing, um, sorry, they, rather their industry task force, the, the Green Finance Industry Task Force, announcing the Singapore taxonomy. Um, and then Malaysia has gone ahead, and I, I think there's others in Mongolia. Um, I think Japan has issued transition taxonomy principles. But what's been interesting to see, and, and maybe the exception is the Korean one, because I, which I haven't looked at in detail yet, but... Um, you know, for the most part, these taxonomies tend to be very principles oriented in terms of you know, helping financial institutions um, think about what is, uh, what is sustainable and what is not, whereas the EU taxonomy is, is very, much more prescriptive in terms of identifying specific technical criteria and thresholds by which um, you know, ec economic activities are qualifying as, as sustainable. Um, and you know, it, it's yeah, it'll be interesting to hear reflections on on why that's the case. And I, I think you know, partly it's because of the stage of uh, stage of development and the stage of advancedness in terms of the economies with respect to sustainability thinking. Um, and I think regulators in in the Asia region, you know, have to kind of retain a certain level of flexibility um, in, in terms of you know, um, yeah, <laughs> I guess to to borrow, I think what Yaka was saying, you know, telling people how to telling people what to spend their money on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jakob, uh, you can go ahead. You had your hand raised first. 
Yeah, I mean, um, when we talk a lot to the Swedish FSA and, and we see there's a, they are on a learning uh, curve starting. Uh, this is a very new field to them to uh, supervise financial institutions on sustainability aspects. And it's totally different from what they're used to because we talk about very uh, vague and uh, it's not just hard numbers, uh, unless uh, except maybe climate risks and, and things like that that you can quantify a bit. But um, we see that, I mean, we would like to have more supervision and regulation on the actual content, but not just on disclosure. But that is also challenging. Uh, you can look at the taxonomy and, and how challenged that, that has been to just agree on what's most green. And it got political pol uh, politicized at the end, which just ruined the, the final outcome. Um, but transparency can work if you can get that information uh, out in a user-friendly way to the actual users, to the consumers, to the bank clients. <clears throat> Someone has to package that because it's quite complex and, and uh, you know, there's been a standard for reporting investment fund sustainability considerations for a few years. I would say it has changed almost nothing because no one has really, pack has really packaged that in a way that it is user-friendly for the actual you know, bank clients and pension savers. So you need some intermediary actors that can, you know, do the hard work and communicate this in a simple way to the public and give them an easy way to act on it. You cannot put the problems in the lap of the public and the consumers. So this is a tricky, it's a, tr a tricky field, but there's a need of, of these kind of intermediary actors. Thank you. Aaron, Aaron, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that, of course, the, the taxonomy and transparency is, is, um, is important and I mean, it's critically important even for, um, so if you hope, if you can have, if the transparency approach is working and you do see this shift in capital and you see this theory of change working in the way it should, and that's great. But you also need the transparency there when it's not working, and that gives an indication to policymakers where where other policies are needed, maybe needed to 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 um, advance transitions in certain sectors or, or certain areas. And I think that also, uh, but without the transparency, then you can't have that dialogue between between policymakers and and the financial sector of why it's working in some spaces but not working in others. So it's it's kind of a necessary condition for for moving the dialogue forward. Okay, uh, thank you. I guess I'll move on to the last question and then we'll move to the Q&A with the, with the public. Um, and in your presentations, um, some of you raised the idea uh, that there's, uh, there has to be a focus on, on, on just transition more or less in the future. Um, but there seems to be a, a lot more focus on the transition itself instead of, of also the risks brought the physical risks brought, brought by climate change in that sense how does how does this impact the market how does this influence consumers and how vice versa consumers influence the market uh, themselves given that they will be the one hit first by by the risk uh, the physical risk itself uh, Maybe a difficult question, I guess. Uh, Keith. I apologize, I actually, I actually missed the question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah, um, I think Ricardo's question was, um, why do people think a lot about losing their jobs in the transition in the economy while not thinking about um, the, the, the vast impacts of climate? I guess that's, that's, a, that's a human nature problem, I believe. Uh, people usually are not uh, used to thinking in a more collective and long term, longer term way, I guess that's my my simple answer. To that is it, it, is that, um, and I guess that's a, that's a fundamental question of um, why climate agreements haven't been, you know, well established until now. Okay, thank you, um, Keith. You had something to add, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I I mean, I think when when it comes to to ind individuals, right. Um, of course, you're going to think about your job, right? Because you know, I, I guess I don't have a particularly eloquent way of putting this, but um, I, I think the some of the issues around climate change is that 
it it feels like such uh, a huge issue that that oftentimes I think people tend can feel powerless um, about it. And if you know you're you're looking at your everyday in terms of putting bread on the table um, and providing for your family, um, that that is something that you can't necessarily get away from. Um, and it's it's not something that you're necessarily going to be able to to say, you know, uh, I, I'm working in the coal sector. I don't want to do this anymore because you don't you don't have any more alternatives, right? Um, and, and that's why it's it's such a it's such a at grad school, I think we learned the term like a super wicked problem um, in which you need multiple stakeholders. You know, certainly consumers can play a role, but to, to individualize the question too much and put that responsibility on consumers is also unfair because there is a certain level of systemic change that, that has to happen and, and governments and our and private sector all have a certain level of responsibility for that. So I know, I know that's a bit of a motherhood and apple pie kind of, kind of response, but um, I think it, you know, it is just a difficult issue. Jakob, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, uh, one thing that I've thought about is the, the way that the financial sector, when it talks about uh, sustainability risks, uh, many talk about uh, the financial risks, uh, but not on you know the risks for those that it's impacting. And um, when you involve consumers, it's it's, it's uh, it's expected uh, to consider the impacts on uh, the ground, on not just the financial risks, not the financial impacts, but also how it affects, you know, the environment and communities. Um, so this is a this is an example of how I think the financial sector is still kind of uh, isolated in its way of thinking without checking with the you know, outside environment. Like, is this the way you expect us to? To act and work with these issues, but I think if you create the right transparency, I mean the the, the example with Nordea expressing itself about a Korean company, why are they doing that? Well, because there's an upside to it; they get good publication, um, uh, how do you say, good PR. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Uh, so I think um, we spin a lot on the upside. You know the the. Uh, like the banks say themselves, we need to involve our clients to make this transition. So that the uncomfortable starting uh, point is to tell people about the problems and then the sector can start creating the solutions. <laughs> so, but it's of course uncomfortable at, at the beginning because then you have to reveal the problems that need to be handled and the individual institutions won't do that themselves because if one goes out and say, hey, look at all these problems we have, the others are going to look better. So that needs to be done by other actors or by regulation and create a level playing field that you can compare and that the same requirements apply to, to uh, the whole sector. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so we, uh, I've seen that some of you have already answered the questions in, in the Q&A. Thank you for that. Um, Although there was a question there that asked uh, specifically about, uh, well, especially SFOC um, role in advising the South Korean government, I, I wanted to turn that question also to, to Mrs. Kim. Anjung, how does uh, your institution work and, and, and impact decision-making in the government, in the National Assembly and all of this? also given the difficulty of navigating South Korean politics. It's actually our institution all the time working for the ministry to set up the policy and legislation, especially enactment or new legislations or amendments. So in this uh, processing, in, we so much involved in green finance including climate change policy. So at that time, we all the time supporting and then assist to set up some legislations. So 2009, we set up some legislation for Green Growth Framework Act. And then we also working for new legislation substituted for Green Growth, Green Growth Act. 
So we finally enacted a new legislation for a carbon nutrition framework act. So it's kind of a new concept to support some renewable energy and green growth and then the other some climate change. So in this processing, we are working for some set up some green finance, especially involved participants, the residents participants in renewable energy, such as some such as wind power act. So we set up some guidelines. How can we divide it some the other specific some benefit for the citizens? So how can we involve or how can we divide some benefit? And then we how can we process this kind of framework for long term? So that's why we involved to uh, set up some leg new legislation. Finally, it's kind of new power to uh, achieve some new target. So our institute all the time working for it, but we are not the expert of finance. That's why we are working with some financial experts and then we get some advice. And also we benchmark some of the other uh, overseas countries. So actually our benefit sharing uh, benchmarked by Nordic companies, countries. So I think probably this year, we also set up some new legislation for ESG because it's kind of voluntary working. So many, some environmental experts all the time consist to set up some legislation for ESG. That's why it's kind of a global trend. So I just hope we can get some new legislation for some mandatory ESG voluntary or, or um, transparency, some governance. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, some more questions. I guess, uh, Jujin, you've, you've answered the question directly in, in the chat. If there is anything you would like to add and the work that uh, SFOC does. Yeah, I think um, there was a question that, that I forgot to answer um, about how we um, engage the Korean, uh, Korean government. I think uh, uh, Dr. Kim, who is sort of in the Korean government, will have a different perspective from us. Um, one example um, is actually a Scandinavia related example is um, we had a session last week um, with about 100 participants um, with offline, online, hybrid, where um, the academic or pension of, I think, Denmark and KLP, another pension fund in Norway, participated. Um, and that was actually the day academic or that was the really important bond standard um, to talk about how they manage their portfolio. Uh, and the audience back then one of the speakers aligned along with the academic grant KLP pension was was um, was was the um, National Pension Service, the world's second largest pension fund after the um, 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 pension uh, the Japan, Japanese pension fund, um, and a lot of um, um, uh, and also the Ministry of Health and Welfare was there, right, which oversees national pension service. So that's one of the ways uh, with the Scandinavian touch where um, we get involved in discussions uh, um, in policy making. Um, Many of the photos that I showed you, the discussions at the National Assembly, the discussions, uh, the communications activity, the um, youth-led activities, also we were uh, somewhat um, involved in those efforts as well. Um, um, so, um, so from bottom up to high level, um, um, I would say a pro engagement, um, we, we, we are involved. Great. Um, we have a few other questions. Uh, so we have one address to uh, you, Jakob, that says, what would you say is the biggest reason banks are reluctant or slow to reconsider investments into more sustainable areas beyond the issue of short-term profits? I can repeat the question. It's... Uh... Oh, I see it now here. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, uh, before our research, because before Fair Finance was launched in Sweden, there was no real independent watchdog that could reveal these things. So there was, wasn't any incentives to either be less bad or be better. Uh, so I think while this comes out into the light, uh, it creates much better incentive to steer towards the green. What's holding back, I think one aspect is the risks uh, by excluding certain sectors, at least, uh, it, it can increase the portfolio risk. Uh, I would say that just pointing to the financial sector's own argument that sustainability is key to the long-term financial performance, it would be a, a, a good bet to do anyway if it increases the risk, but also the possibility to high returns. Uh, but that is the, the usual argument that, that risks increase. I think one way, and, and they are usually not questioned because uh, those that interview a journalist or other are, are not really aware that you don't need 3,000 companies in a portfolio to diversify the, the market risk. Um, so we really, we, we, um, I used to point to a, a big, one of the biggest Swedish pension funds called Alekta. They, uh, they manage, I think, um, 80 billion euro. Um, and they have only around 100 companies in their portfolio. So they're much more carefully selected, which means that they can be more engaged in these companies as owners and they can invest more in each company. And if all investors did this, or many more would do this, uh, the world's companies would be owned by fewer, but more engaged uh, owners and investors. And then the long-term aspect would be more important the, where, because sustainability is a long-term aspect. Um, so this, uh, this uh, short-termism and the, the problem that the financial sector globally, uh, everyone invests everywhere and no one really takes responsibility. The Norwegian oil fund is a, the biggest investor. They own one and a half percent, I think, in every company. So 98 <clears throat> 98.5 uh, is owned by others. Uh, it, so it shows that this, this um, uh, yeah, this is a system, system problem, how do you say? Um, where I think the key is to reduce the number of investments to take more uh, uh, aware bets and you know, reduce the number of problems and bet more on the solutions and engage where there are uh, improvements needed. So I, I think, um, you know, you see, you see a lot of big dragons like State Street and BlackRock, you know, these passive investment funds owning huge amounts, shares of, of companies, but they're being kind of passively managed, which means that these companies are owned by not very engaged owners that look for the long-term uh, survival of the company. I hope it, it, it answers a bit of the question. Keith, uh, you wanted to add something? Yeah, if I may, um, you know, I, I think, again, you know, drawing from, from my previous work, you know, engaging with banks, um, a, a lot of the issue, and then we find you know, that this was the case, especially for some of the, the European banks operating in Southeast Asia, is that when, when a bank introduces you know, restrictive or you know, kind of stringent criteria on lending to issuers in certain sectors, um, that, that's a competitive issue. Because if there are other banks there without similar policies in place, then their clients will just go, go to another bank and get financed. Um, and that was the experience of many European banks operating in Southeast Asia, um, you know, particularly, for example, in, in the interaction with the palm oil sector, um, as an example. So, what, what's really important is, is also for, for banks to kind of work um, and, and improve uh, altogether. So you have a level playing field in terms of the expectations from companies on sustainability, such that it becomes more of a pre-competitive issue. Um, so that, that's on the risky investment side of things. And then secondly, I think I also wanted to flag that many of the most, um, you know, many of the projects and businesses that are most in need of investments are still too inher inherently too risky uh, for, for banks to consider. Um, and, and that's where you know, you, we need to 
kind of figure out more innovative ways to to get finance to the projects that that banks uh, are not willing not so willing to to touch. Um, so so that's where discussions around some of these public private um, partnerships and or blended finance, um, where where you be able to you know kind of introduce de-risking mechanisms to allow for bigger investors and, and bigger banks to come in and provide some of the capital to, to projects which uh, wouldn't have otherwise received it is, is really important. Thank you. Um, there, was, um, there was a question that uh, asked um, most directly to Jujin and Onjung about the task force created by the Ministry of Finance in South Korea. Uh, or not really created yet, I guess, but mostly announced um, as, as a consultative body for specifically green financing and, and sustainable financing. Uh, I see your answer, Jujin, but uh, Dr. Kim, uh, Unjung, do you have uh, do you have any comments on the on, on the task force for from a legislative side from the South Korean government or um, Actually, I'm not sure about some uh, specific some processing or operations in the Ministry of Finance in Korea. But actually, the green finance is still with also some of the other uh, financial service commission. So it, in Korea, we uh, control all financial market uh, by uh, financial service commission so they uh, they get some advantage from government or presidential degree so they and then they make some policy to support or assist many finance fund or financial investment something like money to the korean financial com private financial companies like a bank or the other investment bank so uh, and then try to uh, support some, make some financial project or financial uh, products. So, and then try to sell and then get some benefit uh, around the financial, around the financial market. And so I think kind of many things controlled by uh, financial service commission also get some financial from Ministry of Finance, but anyway, some many specific or project planning uh, made by Financial Service Commission. So actually many ministries like uh, Ministry of Industry and Ministry of, Ministry of Industry and Energy, they try to make some specific project to set up some wind or renewable project to set up and operate in Korea. And then also they try to get some money from uh, funding from Ministry of uh, Finance, but it's not whole governmental money. So they try to uh, get some private sectors like such as SPC. So actually the Ministry of Finance tried to get some benefit like uh, supporting some of money or get some other benefits. So get rid of the tax, something like the other benefit, but finally uh, just give some confirmation to the uh, other ministries or the business sectors. And then the business sectors get some money from the private uh, finance companies and then working the, some other project in the Korean market. Thank you for this. Uh, has, has any uh, endeavor like this been done in Nordic countries that, you know, Yoko, Keith or Aaron, uh, such a task force or at the governmental level or maybe at the, at the Scandinavian level in for regional uh, any any of these? Uh, I guess, uh, Aaron, you can you just remind me uh, the task force related to to, to kind of public private uh, financing structures or? Yeah, um, a 
public-private task force devoted to especially financing uh, green, uh, the green transition per se. Yeah. I'm not aware if there's been any task force. I mean, there's, I can speak a little bit to kind of the industry work that we've done, but of course there's a large, there's a large funding platform where there's direct funds given to industry actors at the research and development and, and piloting stage of these transitions. And the biggest recipient of that so far has been the, been the steel sector, um, uh, which has had larger piloting programs, but uh, all the other sectors in our research, essentially all the other major industrial sectors have received some of this funding. Uh, and then the, uh, the next, at the next stage, there's also a loan guarantee program. Uh, and I don't know how much that has been used. It's quite new but that's directed towards green transitions, larger green transitions investments. And so the government is, is uh, taking some sharing risk in that sense. So, so, low, so they will have some, some first loss risk in those loan guarantees that, the, that they're issuing. Um, but we find that the finance sector, um, I mean, the, the industrial sector in Sweden, I mean, these are large companies and are fairly well established. So they're not reporting uh, expectations at this stage anyway of, of, of significant financing obstacles. So the the direct support at the initial stages is a very important, I think, to get them off the ground and, and, and get going. And then the loan guarantees, they they help, but but they're making these investments more on, on a business kind of uh, basis and, and they can find it, finance it through parent companies or their balance sheet or, or through the banks that they're that they're already engaged with. So I think that they seem to be focusing, once they're getting to this more deployment stage in Sweden, they seem to be focusing more on other issues like um, available electricity or the permitting processes. So that's quite a good story. And in, especially in the steel sector, the reason for that is that those actors now see that they have a lot of orders for green steel. So, so, so that's something that's been key for them. And you've actually seen a new company uh, started in Sweden because they have th those those offtake agreements in place, and so then the financing can flow. So you would want to repeat that dynamic in other sectors. So if you could do that in the plastics sector or or, or the cement sector with public procurement of, of green cement, then of course I think it's much easier to see the financing flowing, and then you need less of these kinds of um, public monies to to make to make it happen. Okay, um, I guess it's, it's about time for, for the last question and then wrapping up. Um, the last question, I would like to um, draw something from, from what Jakob said and from what Unjun said. Um, so Jakob, you pointed out that um, you can't put a problem of this scale into the lap of the public because the public doesn't have the terminology or, or the knowledge necessary to, to unravel uh, something that is this difficult. Um, and attaching this to what you said, Anjung, about involving the residents uh, in building wind power, uh, how, how, how was this conducted? How was the public uh, addressed? How was this explained to them to make it easier to, for them to, to understand? Are there and, and this also goes beyond Korea only, it goes to, to the Nordics. Are there any programs or any uh, activities from, from governments or, or, or investors or, or beneficiaries in general to explain what sustainable financing, what green bonds, what brown um, financing and all of this is? Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, this is kind of a new concept in Korea because to set up some wind power or solar panel in my area, at that time, the participants or residents uh, strong, have strong objections to set up near my area. So that's why our governance all the time worried about how can we get the whole acceptance of the residents that's why we try to uh, study the other overseas countries. And then our model is Denmark. Denmark already, already uh, operate kind of this uh, beneficiary. So we 
got some ideas from Denmark. And then also we set up some guidance to operate. So just I will explain quick, quick explanation about it. So we are considering first, uh, just we divided some steps. First one is kind of just the residence options. So give some choice to the residents near the wind power. So, but also our Ministry of Industry and Energy gives some credit to the power company. And then, uh, so that's why the power company operate their, 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 uh, their, their wind power, and then they get some electricity and then they sell some electricity and the power company gets some benefit and then government also gives some credit. So that's why finally the wind power company share the benefit to the residents when the residents get uh, invest their money to the wind power. So it's kind of very long-term investment. So first one is just a kind of a project or planning to set up some wind power at the time, just to announce to, to get getting the uh, investors. So at the time, just give some the choice to invest the wind power project to just for residents near the area. So it's the step one. And then finally, we open and open wider the, these steps. So finally, poor people, so the other people, the other areas also, we can make some investment of this fund. So it, I mean, this is the public fund, finally. So most people, if you, if they want to, get some like a fund, renewable energy fund, at the time they can invest. So this is kind of very long-term project, but finally whole people, Korean people can get the shareholder or investors. So the steps is divided, but the first step is for just for the residents to get some their own acceptance to set up the power, wind power in their area. But finally, it's the kind of government, our Korea's very ambitious uh, long-term target to, to, to improve the renewable energy. So that's why poor people try to or participate in this project because it, it ultimately uh, make some effects on the electricity price. That's why the government wants to get this opportunity to share and then participate in this project. So it's it's the okay, kind of some steps work. Thank you. Um, anybody else has anything to add to this? Was was there any any such endeavor like this in, in the Nordics, for example? Uh, Jakob, you have. Uh... Um, um, not not I'm not sure, but but um, I mean, just my experience, like working in the Nordics and Sweden, where you know consumers people are quite concerned and aware about sustainability issues. It's more about creating transparency so that they can more make get to see the, the problems and make more informed choices and I think the gov government has been focused on increasing transparency um, by introducing this re reporting standard for investment funds they recently launched an extra funding for the FSA to to look into greenwashing um, practices in in the financial sector and and um, try to to target that so i think if you're in if you're in a, that kind of environment transparency can can lead a long way uh you can you can create incentives for financial institutions to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do that because there's no real <laughs> business case for them otherwise other than to do good and get happier clients and get you know applauded in the media or or, or things like that so um, I think this has also been the 
governmental approach so far we have of course all asked for more strict regulation on the actual content and and uh, on phasing out fossil fuels and things like that um, but it 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 uh, hasn't uh, really happened so far thank you uh, if nobody else has anything to add i guess we could wrap up and uh... Okay, uh, well, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you to the participant for ask, asking questions and, and thank you, thank you the presenters for presenting and sharing your insights and, and experience. I will gladly welcome you again to another webinar like this because I feel that there's still a lot to talk about and, and flesh out about this topic. So hopefully see you in the future and, and thank you for participating. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.